Glad you asked that. That's where we need to keep going. So that's where we'll start. All right, well, let me get you guys started because it is that start time and we really are coming to the end kind of quickly here. I was uh, going to go through it and uh, I knew the end was coming. I mean, I knew Thanksgiving is just around the corner and then finals just beyond that. But uh, as I sat down and thought about it, it's like, wait a minute, there's only three lectures left. Yeah, there's today. Um, there is next Tuesday. And that's the only one we have next week because of Thanksgiving. And then we follow the next week by Tuesday. And then that Thursday is going to be our exam to however far we get. So both good news and bad news. Maybe the encouraging news is hang in there because you probably won't get any sleep between now and, and uh, finals. You'll have a lot to do. But after finals, you've got six weeks before the next semester to kind of catch up on your, on your sleep there. But, but really, we've we, we got just a little bit of doing. So I was looking at it this morning going, okay, I'm going to have to kind of pick and choose kind of what areas that uh, uh, we need to cover and what I want to uh, lecture on. And anyways, it's uh, going to be a tough call here, but I kind of made some decisions here. And so we're going to keep going because we need to make sure we, you know, cover certain things and other things are a little bit... Uh, maybe more um, self-concluding from the physics or maybe they are conclusions from the physics. If they're not self-concluding, they are concluding. All right. Uh, but that's where we are today here. And so we had gotten pretty far into chapter 22, uh, 32, but we hadn't finished it. So let's kind of wrap that up. And maybe with a little bit of luck, we'll even get started into 33. It would be nice, really, if we could do a little bit into 33. Both of these chapters, uh, if I were to describe them, would be uh, no new physics. There's no new physical principle. There's one more new physical principle in 34, and so I want to make sure we cover that. And so I thought I would start by pointing that out, that this would probably be described more as an, an engineering chapter. Take the Faraday's law that we learned, apply it to our circuits. And you're going to see that again in the next chapter. And so these two chapters, a lot like our chapters uh, 27 and 28, are the applied science, the applied physics. What, what could we do with them? Not new principles of physics. But 34 has one new piece. And so I'm going to start saying it now, just to emphasize, I will start going back you learned way at the beginning how do you create an electric field charges and what we have learned now for the last couple of chapters what's the second way to make an electric field changing magnetic field or magnetic flux good so you know that one let's go to the other half of this class how did we make a magnetic field moving charges, moving charges. guess what's going to happen in 34 
There is a second way to make a magnetic field. Any guesses? Changing electric field. All right, so I'll keep saying it so that at least if you can learn nothing else before the semester's over, you can walk into Thanksgiving dinner and go, hey, what did you do this semester in physics? Four things. I learned how to create an electric field twice and a magnetic field twice. Electric field by charges or by changing magnetic fields. Magnetic fields by moving charges or changing electric fields. And that's what we're going to learn in 34 here. And so that's the last piece of the puzzle. And we will finish the semester, believe it or not, in this last lecture is we will just write out those four equations. And I'll say at the very end, okay, this is what we did all semester. Four equations. How do you make an electric field? It's the other way of making an electric field. How do you make a magnetic field? What's the second way of making a magnetic field? And so when this is all said and done, believe it or not, we will kind of have a quick summary here in chapter 34. It says, what have we done? Four equations. What an easy class. Don't let the word get out. It's just four equations. That's all you have to learn. All right, so what did we do? What we did last time anyways is we said let's apply Faraday's law to a circuit itself. And so we came up with this idea of an inductor. And we did that. So what we did is we said well let's do Kirchhoff's loop rule together with this idea of an inductor. We write out the equation. We solve the equation and we got this current. And we saw it last time. It's worth, you know, hooking it up again, or at least real quickly hooking it up. So I already hooked it up. And so when we left last time, we said, okay, here's a six volt power supply. Here's a switch being fed into my inductor, which is then fed to my resistor. And I guess I have to plug in my scope. I didn't, I guess, finish my connection. Thought I did. But there's my scope and so then if I go ahead and take and hook that together, boom, there's what we got. And so we got the current as it was flowing through that resistor. It mathematically followed that shape, okay? And of course, we saw some other things. We changed the resistance. We changed the inductors. And, and in fact, I couldn't resist to at least show you this because you got me thinking. This should be working and I never got good results. And I've always thought it was the way they were wound up and we just had a poor design. But the truth is, that's not the case. It looks pretty crappy. But that's only because what I didn't realize is how big this inductor is. So I hooked it up to the meter to see how big it was and we shouldn't see anything until we're on a totally bigger setting on a time scale. And so we have to get to 50 micrometers. So anyways, wanted you to see it does work. My mistake, it's not wound funny. It's actually quite well and I was playing with it a lot uh, after class last time after you asked with it. And it works well. So that's good because I do want to then use that today to show you some other things. So yes, that is an inductor. You'll see it's about 20 times bigger than the one I just used because that's where I want to continue on now. Let's then go from what we had done in the first lecture to an extension of this. What if I did something like this? Let's still have the switch. Let's still have the battery. Let's still have the resistor. Let's still have the conductor. And so I'm going to draw it more with the uh, circuit symbol than maybe more physically what it looks like. So there's my circuit symbol and let me add to it. Let me call this inductor 1 and then inductor 2. Let me close, close the switch and ask what would happen there. Well, let's write it out. Doing Kirchhoff's loop rule, I would say V equals to L1 di dt minus L2 di dt minus IR equals zero. And I'll start with this, that doesn't this look like a series circuit? 
isn't the current that goes through the first inductor being fed into the second inductor, which is being fed into the resistor. So sure enough, this is what we would call a series. And so just like we did for capacitors first, we talked about hooking them in series and parallels. Then we were introduced to resistors and we hooked them in series and in parallel. Now we have inductors. And so we learned the easy case, the easy case being one inductor, one resistor. What if we now have two inductors? What if we have three inductors? What if we have them in series? What if we have them in parallel? What if, what if, what if? And so you can probably see, at least I'm hoping you see how this is going to work out. Do they share the same change in current, like both of them? Do they share the same or different uh, lengths or different uh, Yeah, well, again, what, if this electron pushes on one and pushes on another and push, well, I guess the electrons are pushing this way. But one electron pushes on another, pushes on another, pushes on another. If, if seven electrons go in here, seven come out, seven go in there, seven come out. So again, the answer is conservation of charge. Yes, so they're going to share. They're going to share the same current because they're in series, or I should say, because of conservation of charge. And when they're hooked in series, they get the same current. And so not only would they get the same current, but they'd also get the same change in current. And so as I look at this math, I would say, well, isn't this just L1 plus L2 di dt minus ir equals zero? And so without too much of a fuss, I think we know how to handle multiple inductors is we just add them together. And so we can call this then the equivalent inductance. And that's why I want to start it today with this equation on the board. You can see that even though we solved it for only one inductor and one resistor, now we can realize that this too would have a solution for the current. The current would be V over R. And then it would be A1 minus E to the yeah, minus T tau. And what we mean by tau again here is L1 plus L2 over R, right? Now what if I did this? What if I said here is R1 and here is R2? Yeah, again, just like we did with resistors, I would have a minus R1 and a minus R2. Those two would have the same current. We can combine them together, and what we would have is a, an equivalent resistance. And so I would probably be best off to just write this as L equivalent and R equivalent. And we know how to put resistors together if they're in series or in parallel and get its equivalent. And now we're kind of learning how I would put inductors together if they were in series or in parallel coming up here. And so I just have to get the equivalent. So the short answer here is if we can take a bunch of inductors and or a bunch of resistors, we could have a much more complicated circuit. But if we can put all those resistors together to be the equivalent of one, and so remember, if they're in series and parallel, we can do that. Now, sometimes they are neither. So we can't always put resistors together to make the equivalent of series and, and uh, parallel, granted. But if we can, then we can write it as just one resistor. And the same thing we're going to have here with our inductors. We're seeing now how you would put them together if they were in series. And so the equivalent inductance would be nothing more than the sum of the individual inductors if they are in series. What do you think would be the equivalent inductance? if they were hooked up in parallel. Yeah, and so if I had a circuit that looked like this, L1 and L2, then I could replace those two. I would say those two are in parallel. And what is it equivalent? 
Well, here's where I thought I'd better save some time today. You can go back and look, but the same thing we did for resistors in parallel, I can write out mathematically. And so just like the sum of a bunch of resistors in series gave us the equivalent resistance, inductors work the same way, and so they also work the same way in parallel. And so if you take the harmonic sum, whoops, and I even put an R there, didn't mean to, uh, inductors, inductors, inductors. And so now we can have a more complicated circuit than kind of the first one we were introduced here today and we can get the equivalent. And so anytime we can take a circuit and simplify it down to one equivalent inductance and one equivalent capacitance, we know it would match this equation and we know that would be the solution. That's what our whole lecture was last time. With that said then, we will see circuits that have multiple inductors, multiple resistors, but they will always be able to be equivalent, guarantee it. Not every circuit is that way, but every circuit we will work with today and this week and the rest of the semester is. So I know many of you are in the circuits class and I'm sure you are doing circuits that aren't as simple as always being equivalent, but I will say right just from the beginning is all of ours will break down to that. That's unfortunately all we have time for, or maybe fortunately because it's, you know, this is a physics class, not a circuits class here. And so keep that in mind that here is how we handle multiple inductors. That's what I'm, I'm getting at. I'll always take our multiple inductors and switch it down to something like this and then there is our, our answer. And to kind of illustrate that, I thought, ah, what a great opportunity to use a meter and this new found idea I got of our inductors. So I'm going to take this inductor that you saw me working with the first time and I will hook it up. I will hook up my inductance meter and so at least those of you who are close enough will see, I'll call this inductor number one, it's 0.13 and the setting is Miller Henry's. And so I would say, all right, Inductor number one, point one three milla Henry's. Inductor number two. Now oh, that was what's nice about this inductor. I now have a second inductor that I can use, and here is inductor number two. And to my surprise, it was significantly more. I've got to even change the setting on here, but this comes out to be. 2.34 milla Henry's. And so about 20 times more here. 2.34 milla Henry's. If I were to hook the two together in series, what would be their equivalent inductance? Yeah, 2.34 added to 1.3 comes out to be 2.47. So, let me give it a try here. So here is this first inductor and here is this and second inductor. I will take and hook them so you can see something like that. So the current could go from here through the first one, from the first one in series to the second one, and then from the second one on back to my meter, and I get 2.48. So, I don't know my partner making a little mistake. It looks like we are right on there. So, within No, no, this is measuring only inductance. This is an inductance meter. Yeah, and maybe I should point that out. I don't think I've used this yet in class and I don't think you've used it yet in lab. Uh, your next lab that you do, and I say next one you do because next week there is no lab because of the holiday, but our last lab here we will be pulling these out and you can use the inductance meter. And this, so 
Oh wait, we used the full capacitor, didn't we? Yeah. I, yes, we did, yeah. And so what's nice about this is it does measure on this end resistance and on this end inductance and on this end capacitance. And when we were working with capacitors, we, we used that one, yeah. Uh, we didn't use it as measuring the inductance, but we did, we did use it, all right? Now, hey, here's a fun one to, to think about. And here's one where, again, this is where we're just going to have to say it's interesting and worth mentioning, especially for those of you going into electrical engineering. Uh, but we're just not going to be able to have time to do much with it. And actually, that's not any different than any semester. In fact, it's not even really different than the book. The book just kind of lays it out there and says, all right, don't forget this little subtlety. It's easy to, to overlook. But let me ask you this. Let me take these two inductors. Let me draw that picture again here. And so here is inductor number one hooked in series with inductor number two, hooked in series with just one resistor, a power supply, a switch, and what we've been talking about these first few minutes here today is if I close that switch, I am going to get a current that follows this equation. Uh, the only thing that might be a little bit different is well, for me to realize that the time constant has the total inductance. And they're in series, so I would add them together, which was what I was showing you there. Okay, so, so there's my total inductance. But what if I changed it a little bit? What if I actually hooked it up physically, so there's an angle between those inductors. Anything different there? <laughs> well, I would say nothing is different from what yet we've talked about. But let's go back a step here. Let's look at this inductor. Why is there an induced voltage in inductor number one? What was the whole discussion last time about? There's a change in magnetic flux. And where is that magnetic flux coming from? Inside itself, right? Inside the inductor itself. So that's why we called it a self-inductance. Is there any other flux in inductor number one? Right, if I were to, maybe a change of colors could be helpful here, draw the magnetic field from inductor one, obviously the field from one is in one. But if I were to also draw magnetic field from number two, what do you begin to notice? The field from number two is also getting into number one. And so the voltage induced in inductor number one comes from more than just the flux from itself. It comes from flux from the next inductor. And that's referred to as mutual inductance. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Let me hook one up and put it inside and see what happens here. But this is my uh, discussion here. And like I said, it's too bad that we don't spend more time on this. Although not really, because I, I, I do think that, you know, what we do cover and what's covered in the book is important. And I like the way the author throws it out here. He, he's kind of really setting the stage for you guys who will go on into electrical engineering and start thinking some about the more complicated subtleties of all these inductors and, and how they're hooked up. But this is a, what we call a mutual inductance. And so when you do cross the stage and you go from just 
one inductor and you put two in there, you have not only the fact that you have to add them as if they are in series and parallel, but there's a mutual interaction between inductor one and inductor two. And if you were to write out the equation then, this equation that I wrote out is really incomplete. This equation should probably look something more like this. V minus L1 di dt, that's the voltage induced in inductor number one because of the flux in number one, but it should also be written as a mutual inductance, and that is some kind of number, we like to give the symbol m here for mutual inductance, that says how much flux from number two gets into number one, and you can imagine if they're really far apart, the answer to that is zero, and so any any set of two inductors that are far apart then have a different mutual effect than if they are close together. And the angle matters and that's why I was saying this picture can be dramatically different than this picture even though they are still having flux within themselves, the mutual part can change. And so this is the piece that is missing from up here and likewise for inductor number two. Inductor number two would have a EMF, a voltage, a Faraday's law, because of the flux induced within itself, but inductor number two should also have an EMF that is produced in number two because of the flux from number one and so we have a mutual effect. And so these are what I'm referring to. These are missing. Now again, fortunately or unfortunately, it kind of all depends on how close or far these inductors are apart from each other. And that's why the layout of something like this is very different than something like this. And maybe I shouldn't use the word very different, but let's see if we can see it. The whole reason I again wanted to do these numbers here is didn't we put these two inductors in series and add them together and get a number that was slightly bigger? What if I were to move it further away? No, no change. What if I were to move it closer? Yeah, a small change. And so it goes up to 2.48. What if I were to, this is really your question, get them really close together and the nice thing about having the two different size ones is what if I put it like this? It really changed. And in this case goes down because I am feeding the uh, coiled side of one to the head side of the other or the tail of one. So if I were to feed it the other direction, then the inductance would start to go up. And so here I get a what we often call a crossover effect. I get effect from one inductor in the other. And so when they're this close together, you know, in this case actually laying with inside of each other, I get an inductance as high up as three millihenries. Whereas when they were completely apart and separated as far apart as I could, I'll even twist them so the flux of one doesn't go through the flux of the other. That's about probably as small as I can get the inductance and it's going down to 2.48. Actually, I shouldn't have said small because I can get it real small now if I let the flux compete with itself. And so the flux from the, this guy and the flux from itself and they tend to cancel each other and there's a loss of flux inside and a loss of inductance. And so this goes all the way down to a 2. And so I can make it as small as a 2 or as big as a 3 depending on the crossover between these ones. And so by themselves, I was thinking they're two and a half, but how I lay them out and how close I lay them, I can, can control them. Which is why I thought I'd pass around one of these FM traps. Here is an old antenna system of mine that, uh, you know, who uses an antenna anymore? Well, well, that's, I guess, why I 
kept my old FM trap and took it apart. But this FM trap, I think, is very quite cleverly designed, and I'll pass it around, and you will see the resistors that have set up in here, but the reason for me to pass this around is you will see the inductors that have been laid out here by the engineer, and have said, look how the flux interacts. And they deliberately put these two inductors, Looks like they've been beat up over the years, but next to each other, tight together, so that they will communicate. They will have a mutual inductance. On the other hand, they put ones below them at 90 degrees, so that they were twisted this way, so that the flux from one of them does not go through the center of the other one. And so those two don't talk to each other. And they've got another pair that do underneath talk to each other, and a pair on top that talk to each other, but the two pairs don't talk to each other. And we've got the same thing going on on the other side here, and then these are far enough away that these, even though they're parallel to these, are essentially far enough that they don't talk to each other. And so they've used this for this FM trap here. And you're probably not familiar with the word FM trap, but when you put up an antenna system in the old days then, you wanted to receive the TV signals and not the radio signals. And so this would trap the radio signals, the FM radio signals, because they make a big kind of streaky lines on your on your TV. So you don't want those coming down your antenna and fed into your 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 TV. And anyways, that's the point. So I think you can you can see the physics behind the mutual inductance. But like I said, I would consider that more of an an advanced circuitry class. And so that's probably best to leave that for your circuits class and let them talk about your mutual inductance and the interaction and how they're laid out once you get past talking about inductance. So no, it won't be on the test. So that's, uh, yeah, so if, yeah. So if you want to, oh, no, no, so not on the test. No mutual inductance on the test. You might say that was just for free. That was hopefully not too much time, but enough time that uh, I think you'll see the, the physics of it. So when, when and if that day comes that uh, you are working with circuits and you've gone beyond the simple basic circuits of just one inductor and one resistor and you start putting up multiple inductors, and you'll kind of know what, what's going on. It is still a Faraday's law, but it is a Faraday law of two inductors that are, that are, that are close to e each other. All right. Well, let's keep going. You can imagine that this chapter is all about our circuitry, uh, where we started with just the idea of what is an inductor. And we started with just one inductor and one in resistor. And then today, all of a sudden, we throw in multiple inductors and even multiple resistors. Oh, but we don't have a capacitor yet. So there's our next. And last step here is to throw in a capacitor. Let's look at this. What if I had a capacitor? And let's just say I charge up the capacitor to get it started. All right, well, I'll do that right away here. And so let me go ahead and start here by disconnecting my uh, oscilloscope. I'll move my resistor out of the way. Here is the 6 volt power supply and here is my capacitor. So I'll start there. Charge it up. Huh? No. Oh crap. Sorry. <laughs> That's not gonna work out. Huh? Alright. So, there's my capacitor. So I take my capacitor and I, I charge it up. So in this case it's at 6 volts, but not worrying about the exact value of it. I'll just say there is some charge Q0. Some initial charge here on this capacitor. Well, what if I took this capacitor and I connected it to itself through an inductor? I mean, we have already did the case where I could connect it to itself through a resistor, right? That was where our RC circuits. And we've been doing now LC circuits. But now let's do CL circuits. What if we have a capacitor and an inductor? And maybe let's talk about this conceptually before we write out the math and before we actually hook it up here. Well, conceptually, what do you think might have happened here? Sure, it says, hey, look, I, there's, there's wires, there's connection, let's, let's send some current out. Ah, 
But what does inductor say? Yeah, the inductor says, oh, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. We're going to oppose that, right? We're going to create a self-induced EMF, a back self-induced EMF. So yeah, it, it tries to make some current, and, and it eventually will, but at first, there's not much current. There is a back EMF. But now, of course, remember, the back EMF here, which would be equal to minus L di dt, only exists if the flux is changing. I mean, in other words, you may not have much current or even no current, but what you must have is a changing current. And so, yeah, you might have no current to begin with. And so if I was making a plot here and I plot the current versus time, or maybe if you say I plot the charge on the capacitor versus time. But as I do this, I guess I would start with a lot of charge on the capacitor. And I might start with no current. But as soon as I hook it up and I make the connection and it starts to flow, there must be a changing current. There must be a slope to it. It is that slope that makes the EMF that says, oh, well, we'll you know, slow down here. Don't let all the charge off at, at one time. But of course, there is then a current, which means then the charge on the capacitor is dropping off. Sure. And I would say now as the charge is dropping off, there is less voltage here, and so there is less push. Uh, there, there, there still is a, a push. And we know from Kirchhoff's law that there's only two elements here, so the voltage here at any given time has to be equal and opposite to the voltage there. Doesn't the sum of the voltage around the loop have to be zero? So if some charge came off of here, went down because we are sending current, then the voltage went down, and if the voltage went down here, the voltage also must go down here. And of course, the voltage is related to how much the current is changing, so there still would be a change of current, but it would be less of a change of, of current. And of course, this would continue, that the charge would continue to go down, and as the charge continues to go down, that means the voltage on this continuously gets less, and whatever voltage is on here has to be equal to the inductor. The voltage on the inductor is related to the change of current, and so eventually what's going to end up happening here is the charge goes to zero, and the current what? Not zero? No. It goes to maximum, right? What's the derivative of the maximum of a function? Zero. So when the current reaches its maximum right now, the voltage from the inductor is zero, right? It has reached its peak. And so at this particular moment in time, you would say there is a lot of current. If you want to think about this in terms of energy, here's what we've done. We started with a lot of energy stored in the capacitor in the form of an electric field. That is now gone. The charges have our left, the electric field is now gone. Where did that energy go? Not heat. We have no resistors here. We did it last lecture. It's the energy in the inductor. There is a magnetic field that has been created. But why is there still current though? If the charge is completely depleted, why is there still current? Okay, I'm trying an analogy. Since you're a mechanical person here, see if this helps. If I took a spring and I started with pulling it down. So this is my spring. I pull it down. When I let it go, this capacitor is giving the push. It comes back up to equilibrium. Is there any more push from the spring when you get back to here? No. But is the weight moving? Yes. And that's what happened here in the inductor. We pushed current in more and more and more kept pushing. The current kept building and kept building. Now the rate of building declined because again these two voltages have to be equal. The voltage here is based on the rate of change of the current and so when this runs out of charge, when this voltage is zero, when this charge is zero, the change in current is zero. But not the current is zero. 
And essentially what happened is all the energy that was electric now becomes magnetic. And just like that spring system I was trying to give you an example, if I pull it all the way down, when I start down here, I would say all of the energy is in the elastic energy of the spring. And when I let it go and it comes back to equilibrium, where did that energy go? It's now in the form of kinetic energy and this thing is moving very quickly. That's where the energy went. And of course it's not done. What will happen next? It'll go and keep going and push itself up. And the same thing is going to happen here magnetically. When we get to this point where there's no more charge on the capacitor, but there's a lot of charge on the inductor, it doesn't just all of a sudden stop right there because what do we know about the voltage of an inductor? Yeah, it is equal to the rate of change. And so as the current tries to begin to stop in the inductor, just like this weight, when it gets back, it just keeps going faster, 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 faster until it gets back to equilibrium. But by the time it gets back to equilibrium, it's moving pretty fast. And the momentum takes it past that in the same thing here. When it gets past here, then the current begins to drop off. As the current begins to drop off, there is a change in the current. And the change in the current in this case is a negative number. And so you can think of this as being a positive side now and not a negative. And so you could think of this as being a battery now. And so what does this do? This pushes current onto the capacitor in the other direction. And so the charge on the capacitor begins to increase in the negative side or the other side. And so as the current goes down, 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 as the current wants to get back to zero, just as this weight, as it came up to here, and it wants to go stay there, but the momentum took it past, and it's slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. As it slows down, it just keeps getting further away, and then finally, it stops. And finally, the current does stop. However, by that time, we've got a lot of charge in the opposite direction. And if I was going to draw it on here, I would make now this side plus and this side minus. And so now the field is created this way. And so the energy in this inductor, which is related to how much current, has gone to zero. There's, there's, there's no more current at that point. So there's no more energy stored in the inductor. But of course, where is that energy now? Now it's in the capacitor again and so the Q squared over 2C is the back in the capacitor. Now granted it's in the other direction and the field points in the other direction but again just like that spring if I pull that spring down when I first start with it down it has a lot of elastic energy and when it gets back to equilibrium it has a lot of kinetic energy. As it moves past there and goes up, now it has a lot of elastic energy again and no more kinetic energy. Yeah? Um, will the rate of exchange between them stay the same as the energy drops off with heat loss? I, I didn't hear that last part. Heat loss? As the energy will drop off due to heat loss. Oh, yeah. Now, there, now, of course, my discussion here is with absolutely no resistance. Okay, and so you might say this is with superconductors, you know, or it's more of a theoretical discussion. Because of course a real one has a resistor. So we're going to finish this discussion by having a capacitor and an inductor and a resistor. We can't get away from it. But I think the best learning process is to start with the ideal situation of no resistance. What happens when an inductor and a capacitor are hooked together. Yeah. There's no resistance, there's no energy loss. Right. No loss to heat. So in this case, just like a pendulum, if there was no energy loss, it would go potential kinetic, potential kinetic, potential kinetic, potential kinetic, and it would keep doing this forever and ever and ever. We're going to see the same thing here. If there was no resistance, what we're going to see is the energy going from electric to magnetic, to electric, to magnetic, to electric, and magnetic, and it's going to keep going this for forever. And so that's why we call these an oscillating circuits. Yeah. Would this have anything to do 
Uh, with the lab where they were 90 degrees off phase? Like one was a sine curve and one was a cosine curve? Um, I would say it's tied to that. Um, you say the lab. The lab that we did on Wednesday, I guess some people still do it. Ah. Uh, ye um, yes and no. Um, and maybe more no than yes. You're going to see that as we get started with the next chapter. Because in the lab, we, we had not a capacitor. We did have the inductor. So in that sense, yes, it's the 90 degrees out of phase. But when we were driving it with an AC source, so this is really an AC source with an inductor, which is the next discussion we will have. It's the start of the next chapter. So I should probably say, probably best to say that thought for what you're about to see in chapter 33. Yeah. Oh, well, fair enough. Let's go through the math and we'll see that it does oscillate. And then we can ask this question, at what rate does it oscillate? What controls the, the oscillations? And yeah, we will see. Obviously, it has something to do with the inductor and something to do with the capacitor. Is that related to the um, this design of the wireless electricity so they can put frequencies? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And so that, that's good. You're, you're seeing the applications. Good, yeah. Right, now I've only done half a cycle so far in my graph here because as you pointed out then because of Faraday's law uh, not only did it oppose the current and then the current build up to a maximum and then because of Faraday's law the current will decay away and as it decays away it's essentially now a power supply charging up this capacitor then just the reverse takes place where now we are starting with a capacitor that is fully charged in the opposite direction and so at this moment in time we would have no current in our little circuit but we would have a lot of charge on our capacitor and now the capacitor would start to discharge and it would start to send current back. So it's the same discussion. As it starts to send current back the other direction here, I, then the inductor opposes it. And again, it says we just have an inductor and a capacitor. Whatever the voltage is on this one, this must be equal and opposite. And for this to be a big voltage, there must be a big changing of the current. And so even though the current is zero, it is changing rapidly. And so the current begins to go the other direction. And of course, as the charge comes off of the capacitor, the voltage on the capacitor goes down, which also means the voltage on the inductor must go down. And of course, the voltage is related to the change. And so the change, which was very large at first, becomes less and less and less. And eventually, at some point, yet again, the capacitor becomes completely discharged. And so the voltage on the capacitor is zero. And so the voltage on the inductor must be zero. And the voltage is related to the change in current. So at this point, we must have reached a minimum of the current or a maximum in the other direction. The slope must be zero. And then the current begins to decay away. And as the current begins to decay away, there is a change in current. A change in current in an inductor treats it as an EMF. Now in this case this would be positive and we end up completing the cycle and the capacitor gets charged the other way and that's one full cycle and then it just keeps repeating again and again and again and again and like this weight on a spring just keeps going up and down and up and down and the energy goes electric magnetic electric and magnetic electric and magnetic and we get oscillations and so our LC circuits are kind of fun and different than anything anything we've seen so far yeah are they related to the sine and cosine yeah so what pattern is this? And I've kind of drawn a sine and here I've kind of drawn a cosine, but we can solve this, right? We can write out the equations and as I said, there's no new piece of physics here, uh, but it is applying the physics that we've learned and so let's 
write this equation out. Uh, just like we wrote out the equation when we had a resistor and an inductor, let's write out the Kirchhoff loop rule. We would know that if you take the two voltage, they have to add up and give you zero. Fair enough? All right, <clears throat> so let me start maybe down in this corner down here and go across the capacitor. How do we get the voltage on a capacitor? Yeah, Q over C. Should I use a little Q? I'm Big Q is okay? I, uh, I, I guess what I'm really getting at is I do want to make a distinction between the full maximum charge it has and the charge it has at any one given moment. And, and you know, just since your author uses the little Q, let, let me be consistent with that and use a little Q because he, he likes to use the little Q for you know, a, the, the, the charge at that moment. And obviously in our conceptual questioning here, we realize it, it does change. All right. And so it is changing here. Uh, we might want to pay close attention to the sign convention, the pluses and minuses that I have just chosen. Because if I were to go from this side of the capacitor to that side and get a positive voltage change, what does that tell me? That this plate is positive and this one is negative. And then on the other hand, if I were to go from here and here and to get a negative voltage, what does that mean? Yeah, so then that would be a negative one. So here's what I'm saying, is this Q then is really the charge on that top plate, right? Whether it's positive or negative. If it's a positive, then I get a positive voltage change. If it is a negative, that means I would get a negative voltage change. And so we do have to watch our signs here to get this equation to work out right. And that, that's an important aspect there because our capacitor, as we just said, keeps changing its, its charge on us. Okay, so the next step would be, well, what's the voltage on the inductor? All right, we've been writing it as minus L di dt. Uh, but again, watch your sign convention here. Uh, for that to work, what you are saying is you are defining positive current that way and negative current that way. And again, that's fine, but just want to make a note of it because we do have current that keeps changing. But that's how I defined it in here, positive when it started on the top and current positive when it started going around that way. All right, so my, my graphs, my equation, they all match and I just wanted to point out our sign convention because there's a little subtlety in the sign here that uh, you want to make sure you, you see. But can I solve this equation? And so just like we did for the inductor and the resistor, in fact, just like we did for the capacitor and resistor, don't I have a differential equation? This is a little different than any of the other ones. All the other ones we've seen have been first order, constant coefficient, separable differential equations. The easiest we can get. Fortunately, this is the second easiest we can get, but it's not quite the same. And so let's try and solve this. Probably the first thing I will do is point out That isn't current, the derivative of the charge. And so that's what I mean, we have a differential equation. But we don't have a first order differential equation. We have a second order. We've got the derivative of the current and the current is the derivative of the charge. So to write this with charge, to solve an equation for the charge on this capacitor, to see what this looks like, I've got to write everything in terms of Q. Now the, here's where a little subtlety is here. Q where? Are these Q's the same? Let's talk about this. What is, what's this Q? Yeah, so maybe I'll put a little sub C to represent. This is the charge on the capacitor. What's this? Okay, so this is the charge going through the inductor. Let me put an L. 
Now, are those the same? Is Q, DQC the same as DQL? Yes. Good. In magnitude, they're the same, but sign they are not, right? Watch this. If this capacitor loses charge, it goes to the inductor. All right, so. Yeah, they're equal in magnitude because it's a very simple series circuit. But they are not equal in sign. They are equal in opposite in sign. All right, so now that is helpful because, again, if my question was, could you solve this? for the charge on the capacitor, then I would want an equation that has charge of the capacitor. So I need to change the charge going into the inductor to the charge on the capacitor. And doing that means I need to change sign. So I go right here from a negative to a, a positive. Ooh. Is that what you said right there? So the QL is now gone. Replaced it with QC and then changed the sign. See, now I have an equation that has a QC in it. And let me write it this way. Let me move the second derivative of Q to the right-hand side of the equation, which would make a negative with it. But I'm going to put the negative over here. I'll put the L and the C together and so that's what I get after a couple steps of, of algebra. And so again this is what I meant by, look, no new physics here, just write out Kirchhoff's loop rule, write out the voltage for a capacitor, write out the voltage for an inductor, watch your signs, solve the equation. And so we have an equation we can solve for Q, right? Now it is a second order differential equation. And I know that, you know, this book says, hey, we're not going to do any math class 160, and you might hear differential equations, but, but we really won't. I mean, it's the, the, we have those simple differential equations. We did one that were separable, and we could integrate them. That's really math 160. And this is kind of math 160. Anybody know the answer to this one? Yeah, I, th let's read it. Uh, let's not try to solve it. Let's just read it. it I, if I was uh, doing this, if I said 2x plus 1 equals 7, could you tell me what x is? Anybody know what x is? How'd you get 3? Yeah, I doubt if you did a whole lot of algebra, you probably more read it. You said, okay, I, you, this is saying take a number, double it, and add 1, and you get 7. Right? Well, 3. And you were kind of analyzing it by inspection. I, I, none of you it looked like you put down your pencil and did this. But I bet all of you did that in third grade, or third grade, seventh grade, whatever grade you start learning a little bit of algebra, seventh, eighth, somewhere in there, maybe ninth, right? And you were taught, okay, that. You want to undo the equation, and so you learn these wonderful things called order of operations, and then the teacher told you if you want to solve the equation, do the opposite of order of operations. And so in order of operations, we multiply first and then add. So when we're undoing it, we do all the adding and subtraction first. So I did that. I subtracted one, and then we do all the multiplication and division next. All right. So you learned all these great things way back in junior high or middle school, whatever it was, and you solved it for that. Okay, fair enough. And I would say that you're going to get into Math 220, some of you are there now, and you're going to use these great techniques to solve really, really complicated differential equations. This is not one of those. Let's keep it simple. Let's read it. What does it say? This is saying, what function could you take its derivative twice and get the function back with a negative? Yeah, think about all the functions you've done. Let's see. Uh, could I do x squared? If I took the derivative of x squared twice, would I get x squared back? No. No, nope, that's not going to work. Uh, let's see. If I took the derivative of e to the x, would I get the function back? Yes, but would I get a negative in front? No, right? So it's not e to the x. Bummer. Hmm. I heard somebody say e to the minus x. Good start. Wrong. 
Because <laughs> if I take y equals e to the minus x and I take its derivative, I get minus e to the minus x. Ah, looking good, right? Take the derivative a second time, what do I get? I'm back to e to the x. So I would say that if it wasn't for this negative sign in front, the answer would be e to the x. And you guys know what it is, right? What is it? Sines and cosines, right? Take derivative of sine, what do you get? Cosine. Take derivative of cosine, you get negative sine. So those are the ones that get a negative in front. Which, by the way, is the same as e to the minus x, if that's where you were going. I mean e to the ix. I mean ix, yes. e to the ix. And cosines are the same thing, right? e to the ix is cosine x plus i sine x. So e to the ix and sines and cosines are the same thing. So for those of you who've gone a little farther and have used complex numbers, we do really like when we have things like e to the ix in place of the trig function. So we get rid of the trig functions and we do a lot of e to the ix. But your author is saying, look, let's just say you don't know about complex numbers yet. Clearly this would be a some kind of sine or cosine function. And so your author writes it as a cosine function. He says this must equal to cosine. It must change with time. Now in this case it actually started with a full charge. But we could have started maybe with a partial charge or some other combination. So I'll throw in the fact that it may not start at a full charge, but that's just for convenience. The way I described it, I did start at a full charge. And so this phi would be zero in my case. But what would go say here? What would go, say, justify these? Again, so let's think about these for a moment. This number in front is what you, if you remember back to your trig class, is that 138 here, 137, something like 38. 38? That's the amplitude, right? That's the, the most it ever has. So in our case, I called that Q naught. I think your author calls it Q maximum. All right, so I'll just go maximum there. And so again, we're beginning to see what many of you already said earlier on. What kind of pattern is this? It looks like a cosine. Yeah, it is. And the math proves it to us. And so this should be a cosineal function and go up and down. Probably the hardest part of any of this is right here. What about the LC? Where does that come from? Yeah, maybe we should look at taking a derivative of our trig functions again. So again, taking you back to ma math 150, if I have y of x equals to cosine of ax, and I take the derivative the first time, derivative of cosine is a minus sine, but what else? An a. And so when I take the derivative a second time, what do I get? So there is cosine ax, the negative stays, and I get yet another a. So in other words, the chain rule pulls out an a, whatever is in front of my variable in the argument of my trig function gets pulled out each time. And so looking at this equation, what do I have in front? Well, I have a 1 over LC. So what must be here? 1 over the square root of LC. Remember, twice. And so again, without really much real mathematics other than what I call, let's solve this by experience, I'm saying you know the answer to this differential equation. Uh, if you don't, you know it now. And so this would be the equation for the charge 
on the capacitor. And so the capacitor would go up, down, up, down, up, down. And the rate at which it goes up and down is related to the L and the C. Uh, we like to write these a lot of times in a more mathematical form that we did back when we did our circular motion in mechanics and we like to write this as a, a, an omega and so in this case omega is 1 over the square root of LC and omega represents what we call the angular frequency it is 2 pi times the number of times it oscillates every every second and so I should be getting a frequency back and forth of that value and it should oscillate the charge on the capacitor should oscillate if I took the derivative of it that would then tell me the current right and I'll leave that math alone here for a second maybe we'll build up to it but now let's hook it up a few moments ago when I wrote this out I said let's take a capacitor and charge it up and so I hook this six volts to this capacitor what you can't see from your point is this is a one microfarad one micro one microfarad capacitor all right so as I try some numbers up here I will have a C of one microfarad. Um, I'll have an L, an inductance. Oh, why don't I use this little one we were playing with? That little one was 0.13 milla Henry's, right? So 0.00013. So that means my angular frequency and my frequency and my period would be what? Okay, well, my angular frequency would be the L times the C. So the L would be point zero 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 one three times one micro and the square root of all of that and take the reciprocal. So this would be about 87,706. Divide that by 2 pi and I get a frequency of about 13,000. 959 take the reciprocal of that and I get about 7.2 times 10 to the minus 5 seconds I guess that's about 72 microseconds so with the numbers I have this capacitor should full, make a full cycle from going to full charge discharging charging the other way discharging again back to full charge in 72 millionths of a second, yeah. Theoretically. Theoretically, let's give it a try. Because there's no resistor, so T is not really L over R. T, L over R. Period, you're talking about tau. No, this is not tau. No, 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 no. Maybe I should emphasize tau is different. Tau is the decay constant of this thing decaying. No, wait, there's no decay here. There's no tau constant, right? This is time. This is the reciprocal of the frequency. This is the period period. How much time does it take for one cycle? So if I got the frequency, the reciprocal of that is how much time? So frequency is how many cycles per second. The reciprocal is how many seconds per cycle. Yeah. What is the represent? Which one? Uh, the, the zero with the line through it. Isn't that the... Yeah. The, yeah, the, 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 the,
the standard cosine function looks like that. If it is shifted a little bit, then that would be the, the normal start of a cosine function. That shift on the axis would be represented mathematically with an added phase of what I used as a phi. So that would change the initial charge? On the right, so this phi physically would represent how far away are we from its maximum charge when we initially started. Now the example I just did on the board and the one I'm going to hook up, I'm going to start with a phi equal to zero. It's going to look like this. I'm going to start with a full maximum charge on the capacitor and then it begins to go through its cycle of discharging and then charging the other way and discharging and going back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, so now coming here to hook this up and looking at the scope, let's see what we have here. Alright, so here is this inductor, which I commented earlier had a value of, where is it? Uh, 0.13 millihenries. Okay, and so let me grab some of these wires here. Here will be my first wire, which I will hook to the capacitor. Here is the other wire, which in a moment I will hook it to this charged capacitor. Well, before I hook it, to the charged capacitor, let me hook up my voltmeter, if you will, my oscilloscope. And since the voltage on the capacitor is the same as the voltage of the inductor, I'm just going to plug it there. So what I can do is quickly disconnect my capacitor and then quickly connect it up because this capacitor does lose charge. I, know, I guess I don't have to be that fast. I mean it's not taking that long. But I do want to get this all set up and according to my math one of these oscillational cycles should take about 72 microseconds. Okay well I've got my scale set on 50 microseconds per each division. Uh, maybe I'll spread it out just a hair more before we get started. Ah, 25. And so we're looking probably at about th close to three divisions here, right? So I'm looking to see if this thing will oscillate and to see if the peaks are not about three uh, divisions apart here. And so I will first disconnect my capacitor and then see what I get. And it looks like it, it uh, pretty much goes. Now, of course, remember I did the inductor and it depends how you hook the wires. It looks like I, you know, start at a negative. If you'd feel better, I'll switch the direction. How's that? Because I didn't pay much close attention to my sign. So if you like, I will recharge it. I will do it again. Ah, that make you feel better? It was bothering you, I could tell. All right, so there it starts on the positive and goes through uh, a set of cycles. And it should be about three. In fact, I could maybe even ma ma mark it a little more accurate with some timers on here or some markers. Let me move this to the beginning, right about time zero. So it even says right here, time zero. I think I got a laser pointer right there. Time zero. And the other little marker, the other cursor, I will put on the peak of that one right there. And it will measure the difference between them. That's what the delta is for. So we're looking at 74. So 74 microseconds, obviously really close to my, my 72 that I, that I calculated. Yeah. Would the resistance on the wires account for the damping inside? Ah, now you will notice. It did not keep the same amplitude. And that's going to be our last part here is what am I missing in this calculation compared to reality? 
is the resistance. And so just like pulling something down, it won't really go back to the same place forever and ever. It will dampen along the way. It will get less and less. And yeah, you are beginning to, to see that. In fact, I bet if I change the time scale so that we are at 50 microseconds per division and we looked at it again, you can see more cycles and you will see more of that dampening effect. Whoops, I missed the thing, so it's got a little jiggle in there. Bummer. Maybe I should try again. Charge it up. Reset machine. Oh. <laughs> but that that's the metal touching and rattling around inside there, making contact and so contact and discontact. So now ah, there's a better connection. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why debounce switches are such a very useful idea and you electrical engineers will design probably thousands of switches that when you make the connection it's on. It doesn't go and make a bunch of connections like that which happens when you put two metal pieces together. Uh, but looking at this you do see that we do get our oscillations. If I move the cursor to the first oscillation I get somewhere in that 72, 73, and I do see more oscillations on the screen, and I do see, as you pointed out, they're decaying away further and, and further. Let's change something here, okay? What do you think would happen if I changed the capacitance? Let's say that I have a lower capacitor. And in fact, maybe I should, for comparison, go back to our 25 microseconds and maybe I should leave it on the screen so there is there I will put that in reference number one and save it and go back to channel one here and I'll get the cursor out of the way there so we're not looking at that, but I'll leave that. That is the oscillation I got with this capacitor. Let's change it. I'm going to move to a smaller capacitor. Let's go to this one that is one-tenth of this one. It's a tenth of a microfarad. Let me charge it up. Let's come back here to understand what might happen here if I had a lower capacitance. Remember, ten times smaller. What's that going to do? It's going to make a higher frequency. So this number should be bigger by the square root of 10. Right? If I put a tenth down here under the square root, flip and multiply, I have square root of 10. Square root of 10 is what? what about 3? 3? 3.1? And so I will take... 72 and multiply by the square root of 10. Uh, sorry, I, I did that the wrong way. I want to divide. 72 divided by the square root of 10. And that's around 23. So I hopefully will see a higher frequency because of the smaller capacitance. I will see a higher frequency by a factor of the square root of 10. And now I'll see a period that is shorter by the square root of 10. And so, I will get it ready here. I will reset my machine. I will unplug my capacitor and I will hook the circuit. <coughs> Well, that's kind of ugly on top of each other. Shall, yeah, shall I? The new one is a smaller period. Yeah, so if I turn it off, there's the new one. There's the old one. If I make a quick measurement here. I will hopefully get 23 microseconds. And so there's my LC circuit as it oscillates back in and forth. 
and maybe in the interest of time I'll leave that alone but we could change the inductor we could change the uh, capacitor this is the the oscillations you asked about this this is great radio and um, um, uh, wireless communications how do you make all these crazy frequencies like 2.45 gigahertz that we use on all of our Wi-Fi machines that we have around in here and we probably have at home and you have at the coffee shop and I mean you can't even walk into Home Depot without my phone going crazy hey can I connect to your phone da 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 although I guess I'm not complaining I love it you know I just, standing there in front of Home Depot and they had this great hardwood floor I go ooh that would be neat why don't you put it in scan beep showed me a little YouTube video god this is easy I could do this <laughs> so I guess it works. I loaded up my cart, bought all the hardwood floor, took it home. All right. So we'll see how it goes. All right. That'll be my Christmas project. <laughs> so the, but this wireless technology is, this is where it's coming. How do you produce these frequency? If you're the electrical engineer at a radio station, I mean, if you tune into uh, some of the stations around here, 99.9 .9 is... Um, K-Tide, the 95.9 is um, Rewind, you can see that I only listen to the classic rock stations, um, but, but whatever the station is, how do the engineers produce those frequencies that they are then sending up the transmit tower? Right here, well, right here, they're hooking together a resistor and a capacitor, they're making it oscillate, and they're making their frequency, and they're making sure their frequency is different than somebody else's frequency. Do they um, take account of the relativity of that? What do you mean by that? Like Expand. the oscillation. The oscillation? Go on. Yeah, this velocity and all that stuff. Uh, remember, no. Okay. Now, remember, these electrons are not moving that fast. They're only going at their drift velocity, a fraction of a centimeter a second. Oh. Right? So, no, there's no real um, relativity effect um, until we mentioned the last lecture of this semester and so I'll wait for Tuesday of two weeks and I'll add to that but for right now I'll say no 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 relativistic effect yeah yeah uh, it's certainly not what what you're thinking of anyways uh, anyways I thought I would grab one of these is because here is an oscillator that I I don't know I had an old microwave and I go you know I wonder how this crazy thing makes these frequencies and so if you don't know microwaves do operate at 2.45 gigahertz that's why they, those crazy things interfere with the Wi-Fi and they're kind of a pain but this then would be built with a certain set of inductors and capacitors in just a way and so if you take the magneton and in this case cut it in half here and so here I have it was like this when it came out of the microwave and so we ran it through a, oh shoot Ran it through a bandsaw here, all right. But you can see the capacitors and the inductors in here. They're a little hard to notice, I must admit. I was kind of hoping they were a little more obvious. Um, but let me point it out here as you kind of look in here. But when you look in here, uh, you will see that the design team, which has a fascinating, interesting idea, because the, the British designed this during World War II, and you know, as we say a lot of times, it's atomic weapons ended the war. What won the war? Radar. This magneton. This created radio waves that could send up and see where the German fighters were, where they were headed, and without that Britain would have never made it through the summer of 1940. It would have been a definitely a different world. We'd probably all be speaking German right now. All right? And so that's was their big invention. That and they smuggle this across the, the ocean and to MIT and back and forth a number of times. But as you look closely at this, you will see that it has a number of radial arms heading back. And I think this one has 10. Let me not draw all of them. But they are all hooked together. And I'll only focus on two of them for a moment. But if you were to start with that charged positive and that charged negative, there's your capacitor. And what will happen is it will discharge. And it will flow around. And it's a single loop of an inductor. The metal itself is a one single loop inductor. 
And so it will create a magnetic field that will then make this charge up positive and that one negative. And then it will go back and forth. But to do that 2.45 billion times a second, where mine was only 13,000 times a second, you're going to need a lot smaller inductance and a lot smaller capacitance. And that's how they get it. Right there. And so if you want to take a look, feel free. Yeah. Wait, so how do you really push energy into this? Obviously, if you have to put energy into it somehow, do you put it into the conductor? Uh, no, then... There, yeah, well, it is an external energy source. You're right. This, this is going to lose energy. You see it here as it decays away. You've got to feed energy into it. And they, again, very clever way. It's this way. If you look at that, they send a beam of electrons down the center and deflect the beam with a magnetic field. And that's what got the charge in the first place. And then it'll start to oscillate. You'll get less charge. And the beam will go down and recharge it and recharge it and so your oscillations will go and be re-energized and be re-energized and they'll do it continuously so it just kind of reaches a steady state constantly making the microwaves and then there'll be a microwave guide and my, my piece of cold chicken will be warm and I'll be happy you know sort of, with all that energy but that energy then and it's maybe a good example when that piece of warm chicken comes out of the microwave it's heat energy where did that heat energy come from uh, <laughs> yeah microwaves they're made out of electric and magnetic fields right and so we know that the energy in this is electric and magnetic and so all that electric mag magnetic energy then is directed into my food eventually making the molecules move and eventually going into heat yeah can you take that frequency and convert it back to electricity um. oh absolutely and then this you might call this the transmitter. In fact, this is what we will do in chapter 34. This, you might say, I just generated a frequency. Now, granted, it wasn't for very long. It, you know, this thing probably tapers off and stops making uh, a frequency, stops making our waves, really probably, you know, in at most... 200, 300, 400 microseconds. But if I kept feeding in energy, as you said, this thing could keep oscillating and then those electromagnetic waves could be picked up, say, over here. Over here, if I took just a wire, you would call it an antenna. And if I put an antenna over here, this antenna has electrons. So if that thing is producing electric fields, doesn't the electric field put a force on these electrons? And then these electrons would start moving up and down. And they would go up and down based on the force on them. And the force would be based on that frequency. And so if I, this is my transmitter. So this is my cell phone. And this is the cell tower. The information coming from my cell phone shows up in the cell tower because of the electric field. On the other hand, I could take a wire in the cell tower and loop it around. And now, the magnetic field that is created by that is picked up because of the induced flux. And so my antenna over here can pick up that frequency was your question. And it can pick it up either coupling into the electric field or coupling into the magnetic field. Or both, better still, but we'll wait a couple chapters on that, yeah. Yes, so I start with my cell phone. I make radio waves. Then it goes into electricity in the cell phone of the person receiving my call. Why does it still need that? Oh, because the, the amount of electricity is very, very small. It wouldn't be enough to drive a speaker, and I will need a battery. And of course, today's cell phones, I need a battery because everything else that it does. I got to keep my calendar and my Facebook page and my Twitter page, you know, and all that stuff. That's probably most of it. And the, the light from the screen and, yeah, yeah. Huh? I, I do not. I, I, I must admit. I, 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 no. 
Uh, yeah, I don't know if you want to say I'm the old generation. I, I, I did. I, I signed up for Facebook one time. I, my college roommate, he, he was out hunting in Idaho. He goes, oh, yeah, I got some great pictures. I want you to see them. All right. I, I can't see them. He goes, well, you don't have a Facebook account. Okay, I'll do a Facebook account. So I get a Facebook account. So it was cool. I looked at all his pictures. Next day, I had like 100 emails from all over the place wanting to be friends. Now, I got nothing against friends. I just... I can't, I can't handle that many friends. I don't have that much time to be that friendly. All right? I'm just not that friendly. I don't know what you want to put there. I'm just, I'm just not that friendly. So, <laughs> And uh, even to this day. So I do. I do do the LinkedIn. I think a bunch of you have LinkedIn. So I'm like, uh, LinkedIn with a bunch of you. So I, yeah, I, 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 I kind of do that just to to be linked in, I guess, to connect, but I was like, I, I, I think of it more for my students than it is for me, and I, yeah. Uh, in the microwave, how do they make sure that the, it's even, like the frequency is even all over in the, in the box? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, without maybe too much ado here, the, the box looks like this. This ma magneton generator is off to the side. You, it's behind all those buttons you push. You've got a number pad here, and then it's got a waveguide. And so it generates all these waves. It sends it through you know, a metal pipe, if you will. It gets here, and then there's a scatterer. It's just a, like a little round fan. It just kind of goes around, and it hits the waves, and so it ricochets them that way, and then ricochets them that way, and ricochets them. And then, of course, they ricochet around also until they finally hit my piece of chicken and warm up. So they do their best to scatter them equally randomly and to get it equally. But many of you will probably know that over time, the even a new one, but mostly over time, the original design doesn't work right. I know mine's that way, that you know, one side cooks a lot better than the other. So when I put a piece of chicken in there and turn it on, I do about half the time so I can turn it around and do the other half oh, of the yeah, time. Dish. And then the spinning dish is another approach. Instead of scattering the waves, rotate the disc or do both. And so as you get to more costly microwaves, they do more and more so they cook more, more evenly. Okay, yeah? The magneton, so you recharge it by stroke firing electrons into the positive side, correct? Uh, electrons would go to the negative side. Okay, well you fire into the negative side, right? Yeah, right. But where does the extra electrons go to? Like, you, like obviously you need to stop having so much electrons in there. Oh, okay. Yeah, well it's no different than two power supplies. So I have plus and minus here, like that. Um, this this is extra electrons, this is lacking electrons. And so as they go back and forth, there is no place for them to go other than to settle out and then they're even. The, the extra quote unquote ones that you are adding to it, which are coming from the outside that feed in here, then also remember this is connected to the power supply that was feeding these extra electrons. So the extra electrons complete its circuit too. So we have two power supplies, two circuits, and they, they complete it a lot like we did with our in the lab with our with our one power supply made the heater and boiled the electron and the other power supply made the accelerating ball. Like energy lost of the photons. The microwave is the photons, so don't mix uh, those two. Yes, yes. And mostly we want the photons because we'd like to make as many microwaves. But I think actually microwaves are only like about 60% efficient. So, you know, when you go and you plug it in and it, and it takes 1.4 kilowatts of power out of your plug, you only get about 1,000 watts of cooking power. And that's why, again, all your microwaves, if you look closely at them, they always have those two ratings. One rating is how much power do they draw from the wall and the other one is how much cooking power do they have? Because that, that's going to be a big, important issue to all that. All right, well, let's put closure here to this and take the very last and the final step. Now that we have, I think, discussed quite well about the two together, the inductor and the capacitor, we can now take this next step and say what would happen if you put a 
resistor in there. And of course now we're going to get a much more complicated equation and now I would say we've probably crossed the line of a differential equation that is probably best solved after you have gone through 220. So your author just says let's not even solve it let's write out the equation and give you the answer. I'll do the same. <laughs> let's write out the equation so you can see the physics behind it and let's give you the answer. I think if I recall from students in the past telling me you guys in your math 220 actually solve a lot of LCR circuits as examples in your class. Is that fair? Yeah. And so you probably have this equation or seen it already. If I add this up around the loop and I'll start with the capacitor since I did that to begin with but I would have a Q over C for the voltage on the capacitor I would have minus an L di dt for the voltage on the inductor and I would have a minus IR for the voltage on the resistor. And no battery in here. I'm just going to start with a charge capacitor and go down. Now if you want a power supply added to it, good because that's exactly what we're doing in the next chapter. We're going to add to this and put a power supply in here. Um, but I could write this then as Q of the capacitor over C plus D second derivative DT charge of the capacitor. Now again notice I did the same thing as last time. I changed the sign as I thought about the current not in the inductor but the current in the capacitor. And likewise, same thing here, this would be R and this would be a do Q D T. And this one here I don't think you would, you know, be able to solve by inspection. You might kind of get close. This one really does take the next level of mathematics to say how do you solve a second order differential equation. But maybe you could begin to see it because you already know if you just had that much it would be sinusoidal. And you already know if you had this much, just the capacitor and the resistor, it would be exponential. And the fact then that it has multiple terms and the fact that you know derivatives change products into two different terms probably would make you think here that the charge as a function of time probably looks like the two functions multiplied together and, and, and they do. And so again, without real proof in here, I am going to say that there would be, and let me give myself, well, that's probably enough space, but I would have the decaying exponential from this part of the circuit and I would have the oscillating part from this part of the circuit. I changed it positive because, yeah, this is going to be the charge on the capacitor and the, the um, what's going into the resistor positive is coming from the capacitor. And so like we changed it on the last one. Uh, but again what I would get then is I would get some maximum charge here with some oscillations and some decay. Uh, the decay is a, well it's got the minus T in it, but it's got the 2L over R. So it's got the, the L and the R as you kind of expect. Two uh, but the 2 I think kind of, yeah, throws it off there. But not really when you say, wait a minute, this is the decay but maybe it's doubled just because I've got not only the decay because of the LR circuit but the decay because of the CR circuit. But nonetheless, there's a, there's a 2 that does show up there. And, and yeah, I see you guys are looking at your math 220. It's exactly that solution. And then the other part of this is you would have the sinusoidal part and the fact that it has a 1 over LC probably is not too much of a, a surprise because that's the part we would have gotten and we just did without the resistance. The part that um, adds to it is that there would be a slight variation in the frequency or a lot of variation in the frequency depending on how big that resistor is. But the one I showed you that I still got on the board there, that one there doesn't have much 
resistance. And so what you see is a combination of these two functions. You see the cosine, I think, and you see the amplitude of that cosine function tapering off and decaying away and getting less and less and less. Yes, and that's it right there. So you could think of this whole thing as the amplitude of your cosine function. So it's a cosine function that then gets with a smaller amplitude based on an exponential. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, again, hopefully what you see. In fact, maybe I should draw it. So that would look like where the decay is e to the minus t over 2l r. And so there's our r decay. And I did my best to set it up with the minimum amount of resistance because I just hooked up the wires and that was it. And of course we saw all that decay. Let's start asking the next question. Go ahead. So is this called LRC circuit? Oh! You know I don't think the order matters. LC, I think I always, well, I learned it as LCR circuits. But, and I should point, LCR series circuit. Because that's all we've done. We could start putting them in parallel. We won't. We'll wait for your circuits class for that. Okay? But for this class, again, just trying to get the, the basic physics, we'll do it. Um, but I always refer to them as LCR circuits. But I did, I think that order is different than your author. What does he call them? And since they're all in series, it won't matter. Yeah, he, he does the R first. So R, L, C circuits. Okay. Um, but they're, they're in series. So the, certainly the, the order of which they are put in the circuit doesn't matter. Now somebody pointed this out that this is without a power supply. So this is going to only oscillate, as you can see, for a small fraction of time, and it's not going to keep going. All right, fair enough. So, the start of the next chapter, if you will let me, because I know we're going to be just pressing for time, and I'll do as much as we, we can to cover the material here. But let me actually start chapter 33 then, and say, okay, look at, let's look uh, chapter 33 here real, real quick. Uh, let's do the, the same thing. Let's take a resistor, R, an inductor, L, and a capacitor, C. So I'll try to do the same order. That was the order, right? An R, L, C. And so this is what we just, you know, spent the last 45 minutes or something talking about here. Let's add to it. Instead of having a capacitor that starts off charged and all the energy comes from then and eventually decays away because of the resistance and the heat that is formed, what if instead we hook a power supply here? Now I'll start with this question. What if I just put a regular power supply that we've been doing throughout this class? Boring. What happens? <coughs> yeah, I guess at first you would say the capacitor maybe is not charged so it just acts as a short circuit. So at first we really just have an RL circuit. And we know what that looks like. We've just been talking about that. But of course there's a slight added effect that the capacitor now begins to build up with this charge. And of course, eventually what happens with when you have a capacitor in there? It gets full charge. How much current do you get then? Zero. You get a full capacitor and nothing else is moving. Okay, boring. So, we should at least mention it. But it will become much more interesting if we put a different type of power supply. And so you might not have seen this symbol before. 
But this right here represents what we're going to call voltage changing with time where it has some maximum times the sine of 2 pi f t. In other words, this looks what we're going to call a sinusoidal voltage source. It changes. And so before the capacitor can get fully charged and stop what we, our current, it will now start to discharge it. And nothing ever stops. And far more interesting things happen here. A lot of interesting things happen here when our power source is sinusoidal. So we like to say that we have then a sinusoidal voltage. You're probably more familiar with the less mathematical phrase of we have a alternating voltage. We have a C, which maybe I should say voltage slash current because if the voltage alternates, that makes the current alternate. And that's what the C is for, the, the current. And so we have an alternating voltage. We have an alternating current. It goes back and back and back and back and forth. Where's the most common place to find an AC voltage? Oh good, you guys didn't let me down. It's the wall. Didn't we talk about these generators here? We said that if you took a, a loop and you spun it, it would induce an EMF. Oh, in fact, we even went through the math two chapters ago. Didn't we find out that if you plug into the wall here, the voltage as a function of time equals the number of turns, the strength of the magnetic field, the area in our coil times omega times sine omega t. You remember working that out? All right, and so that's our generators. And we said that the world around us gets most of its electricity from the moving magnets. It also fits in really well with the general physical principle that I want you to get. There are two ways of making an electric field. One of them is from charges. That's what batteries do. Batteries got a lot of little chemicals that react and we get an electric field. We get these pushes and pulls of our charges. We get charges from or we get the, the moving of the charges from these electric fields from the forces from those charges. And so that's one way of getting an electric field from charges themselves. And of course, the second way of getting an electric field is changing magnetic flux, a changing magnetic field. And so if we change that, and in the case of our world, we simply just take a coil and we let it spin near a magnet. And as the thing spins, the flux is going to go through the loop one way and then it's going to turn over and essentially be going the other way. So it's not that the, the magnetic flux changes, but the loop changes. And so what we will get is we will get a voltage that constantly changes. And so that's probably the simplest way to get an AC voltage. Let's take a look at it before we go too far here. Let me actually... plug my wires straight into the wall. Now, that's going to be quite a big voltage. Um, hang on here. Is there a display? Let me Okay, let me kind of just set this a little bit different. Let me, I'll just turn the cursors off for just a second. But I'm going to change the mode on here a little bit. And so what you'll see is a little bit different. It's what we call auto mode. It just, it's constantly sampling how much voltage do you get. All right, so I'm just going to keep going. It's not waiting for that magical point like the other one. So it's just constantly sampling. And I've got nothing hooked up to it. 
but if I take some wires and plug them into the wall and I just wanted to change the voltage there's gonna be a lot of voltage in the wall so let me change this and it looks like the most I can go is 10 volts per division unless I use this little amplifying probe and so I'm gonna plug it in ah there's a hundred volts per division and that's probably even too much I'll turn it whoops wrong way down so let me set it at 50 volts per division and let me find some place to plug it in to hmm. let me keep my finger close to that button but I'll see if I can shove it in the plug here I think I got it. Let's see if I can capture it. Did I get it? Oh. Good. I grabbed it. Okay. Good. So I grabbed it and saved it. And so there is the beginning part of this chapter. What kind of voltage do we get from the wall? Yeah. An alternating. What is that number here and so let's give it a measurement I'll call it 170 but the truth is usually I get more than that here we got some pretty strong voltage here apparently so let's see what uh, I get here but I'm gonna take my cursor and I'll do the horizontal cursor here this time and I'll put one of the cursors at zero volts or zero ah right there and so looking up there I got okay I got that one at zero volts the other one is different by 29 but let me take the other cursor and go to the maximum there huh 174 not too much more but uh, back in that electronics room we guys keep all the equipment uh, tend to get like 180 and something so anyways it varies obviously it's you know there's wires and resistance that run around probably closer to the uh, transformer there but it looks like I'm getting 174 some of you said 120 no it's not 120 where'd you get that word yeah so we're gonna call the RMS and I don't know if we'll quite get there today but we'll be darn close here so we need to talk about what I mean by the peak voltage the amplitude at 170 and the not so peak the the average now notice though I do want you to see that it does alternate so it goes up to 170 how far does it go down 170 so there's a difference of 340 volts between the movements of this so there's quite a bit of volts in the wall obviously that's why you don't put your tongue in there or try to <laughs> stick any metal pieces in there there's a there's a lot of voltage and, and uh, very dangerous there so that what you will see let's look then at the frequency the F what is the frequency yeah you said it right say it again what is it yeah it is 60 let's see if I can measure that here where's my measurement window here is frequency I'll let the computer measure it and the computer will display the frequency so there's the 60 Hertz so it measures my frequency 60 Hertz uh, the reciprocal of that would be the period what's the reciprocal of uh, a sixth one six 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 so the period should be point zero one six 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 so measurement period point zero one six 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 yeah and so there's the the period the 60 Hertz and of course we did that lab with the the Elisiju figures where we needed to know that the uh, frequency was 60 when we you guys were learning how to use the the scope uh, last last week there so again that's where we get started so here's our goal our goal is to say this is what we're going to do we are going to hook up an alternating voltage to an LRC circuit now that might be a little too much to do at one time so let's start a little bit easier let's just hook up an alternating voltage to and just a resistor that's going to be the easiest one and that's probably all we'll get to today yeah wait so but the thing is the, the LRC has its own natural oscillation frequency 
Oh, it does. So what? So wouldn't adding, in, wouldn't, wouldn't adding a power to its own oscillation like interfere with that in some way? Oh yeah, they'll get. Yeah, this will be really fun. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. There. And I think the word you're searching for is it will resonate. All right. And we saw the same thing in our mechanics with our springs that we could put in a driving frequency but then it will also have a resonant frequency. Well, you guys in your math, that, what do you call that? You have like a particular solution and a general, a general and a particular solution and that's what you'll, you'll see. You'll, you'll, you'll have both of those come out in the, in the math. Okay, so let me hook up a different alternating frequency and I'll just use this one here. Uh, partly because I don't want to electrocute myself here. So you see the wall and I need you to understand the wall's voltage. That's why I wanted to do that. But to actually show you some of these, let me just actually take then and use our little signal generators and take this one. And let me feed it to my resistor. And in this case, why don't I set it and I'll just set it at uh, a thousand. All right. And so there is my simple circuit. Uh, I haven't quite built up to something this sophisticated yet. I have something much simpler. I have gone all the way back to just a resistor, one resistor, but our power supply that changes with time. What will I get for the current in that resistor? Well, here's what I've been saying the last chapter as well as this one. No, no new physics, just apply conservation of energy and conservation of, uh, of charge. In other words, let's do Kirchhoff's loop rule and solve it. All right, so let's do the loop rule. I'll start here. I'll say from here to here would be the voltage as a function of time. Okay. Then I would get minus IR equals zero. And maybe to be a little more particular with my math, I would say this is some maximum voltage sine omega T. So there is my sinusoidal source. Uh, it looks like the one I have hooked up here. Oh wow, I didn't realize it was quite at such a high frequency, but nonetheless, we'll look at it. This is, says on here, 183 <coughs> kilohertz. So this is 183,000 hertz. Uh, so maybe I can see it and point to it and talk about it here. Let me hook up that to my scope and change the time base to 2.5 microseconds, the voltage base to 5 volts and so I'm getting uh, going up about 10 and down about 10. Um, maybe I'll put the frequency measurement back on here. So there it says. So the little oscilloscope says it's at 183 kilohertz. My little box here says it's at 183 kilohertz. There it goes back and forth. And so that's what I'm feeding into here. But here's my question for you. If I feed this alternating voltage to a resistor, what kind of current will I get in that circuit? Yeah, probably not surprised it'll alternate, right? Let's run through the math. Let's solve this. Could you solve this for I? Sure, I equals what? Okay, it would be the maximum voltage divided by... Oh, <laughs> divided by R times sine omega T. So this is the one to start. It, it, to be quite honest, it's not that exciting. But notice a couple of interesting things here. The first interesting thing is the current does change. Makes sense. We put in an alternating voltage, we expect to get an alternating current. And notice that the rate at which the current oscillates is the rate at which the voltage 
oscillates. Let's see if we can also see the current up here. So we're going to play a little trick, the same trick you guys did in the lab yesterday, or some of you will do today, but I'm going to want to also look at the current. And so let me turn on a second line here, channel 2. And so the channel 1, the one you're looking at now, is the voltage, but I can also look at the current. Unfortunately, oscilloscopes don't measure current, they measure voltage. So what I'm going to do is put a small resistor in here and measure that small voltage on that resistor and since it's tied to the current that'll give me some indication of it. But I want to make sure it's small enough that I can kind of justify that I'm not affecting this resistor. That's why I set this one at, what did I say, a thousand or two thousand, something like that. And so I'll double check it. Let's see, this was, yeah, I guess it's a thousand. So let me take another resistor. So you're saying decade bucks, but so that it's low enough, maybe I'll do, um, I want it big enough that I can see something decent. So why don't I go to 50? That's not too much, but still something. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So this gets fed into my resistor, and instead of going all the way back, let me feed it to this second resistor first. So then, what I'm looking at, maybe I'll change a couple of wires here, is this is the voltage, again, coming from my power supply and then this is the voltage on that little small resistor. And so you'll notice something you haven't seen before. We've got both channels. Um, this channel 1, each division is worth 5 volts and channel 2, each division is worth 5 volts. So I'll put them on the same setting so we can compare. But you will see, eh, maybe I better go to a slightly higher setting on each of them. Oh, and that kind of goes off the off the scale. All right, so maybe I will leave. Well, okay, okay. So I lied. I'm not going to put them on the same scale because that one that scale is so small. But I'm hoping you can see this. That channel 1 at 5 volts per division means the voltage goes up about 10 and then down 10. Channel 2 is really measuring the current. And so you can see that the current does go up and down. And that's the first thing I want you to notice, that the current changes just like the voltage, the same frequency. If I change the frequency of my voltage source, say make it a lower frequency, not only does the source change, but the effect, the current changes. If I increase the frequency, then of course we get likewise change. So not a surprise there. The amplitude is smaller or bigger depending on what you're dividing by, right? So in my case, I have probably a, about a 10 here and a thousand there. And so the amplitude of my um, current is only about a hundredth. But of course I am feeding it through about 50 ohms. So 50 ohms times a hundredth is about a half a volt. And so sure enough you see it go up about a half a volt and down a half a volt. And so channel 1 again is measuring the voltage and channel 2 is measuring the current. Again, you're, you're probably not real surprised at this one. It'll get far more interesting with our inductors and our capacitors. So we're going to probably have to wait for that. We'll probably have to wait for one more thing, but let me finish with this question. What's the average voltage? Isn't it zero? What's the average current? 
zero. Oh, let me, let me change the dial a little bit. Let me turn the voltage down a little bit. Now when I say turn it down, I mean the peak. What's the average voltage now? <laughs> zero. What's the average current? Can you see that no matter what I set the maximum to, the average is always zero? It's not going to do us any good to talk about averages. We can though talk about average power. And therefore we have to describe the voltage and current a little bit different. And that's what that RMS is going to stand for. So we'll wait for Tuesday for that. But we, what we, we talking about the average current and the average voltage is, is kind of pointless for an AC circuit. RMS though, very useful. Why is there equipment that doesn't work on that negative voltage though?